history, the American Revolution, and the impact that the American Revolution had on the abolition, abolitionist movement in America that was just taking off um, during the American Revolution. So it's, it's great to be here to talk to you about that today. And so um, I think what I want to do is to start today's discussion with the quotation. And it's a quotation from one of the most important colonial history, colonial American historians of all time, in my opinion. And that person is Edmund Morgan. And so I'm gonna share with you a quotation uh, from one of Edmund Morgan's many works on colonial American history. And so Morgan states, quote, the rise of liberty and equality in this country was accompanied by the rise of slavery. That two such contradictory developments were taking place simultaneously over a long period of our history from the 17th century to the 19th century is the central paradox of American history. The challenge, for a colonial historian at least, is to explain how a people could have developed the dedication to human liberty and dignity exhibited by the leaders of the American Revolution and at the same time have developed and maintain a system of labor that denied human liberty and dignity. And so Edmund Morgan, um, again, one of the great colonial American historians of all time, was making a case about what he argued was the central paradox of American history. And that is how could a movement for freedom, equality, also at the same time accompany right, the intensification um, and, the, and the sanctioning of slavery in the American Republic. And so for him and a generation of scholars um, after him, this was the central paradox. And so they busied themselves with trying to figure out how this seeming contradiction could occur. And so what I wanna to do today is to really frame my discussion of abolition during the age of the American Revolution around Edmund Morgan's quotation, right? Around his call of action to scholars of his generation. And so what I wanna to try to do in framing my discussion around that is to complicate this notion of the presence of slavery in, the, in America, both during, or before, during, and after the American Revolution is the central paradox of American history. I really wanna complicate that if I can. And then ultimately what I would like to have a discussion with you about um, after the lecture is how to talk about right, this very problematic but also transformative period in American history, perhaps in your classroom. So those are the two things that I wanna try to accomplish today. And so before we can really dive into the, the issue at hand, I think we just need to provide a little bit of context, right? And so when I'm referring to the age of the American Revolution or the age of revolution in this lecture, um, I'm talking about some specific years in America. And those years are 1776 to 1787. Obviously, 1776 is the year in which um, American colonists right, break away or declare their independence from Britain. And 1787, of course, is the year in which those same American colonists who are now American citizens or would be American citizens draft and ratify the United States Constitution, right? Officially, and forever severing the tie between them and uh, the British Empire or Great Britain. And so when I talk about um, the age of, excuse me, abolition and the age of revolution, it's 1776 and 1787 that I'm specifically referring to. Now, uh, for today, um, I asked you guys to 
read um, a, a small selection from a really good book um, entitled Holy Warriors, The Abolitionists and American Slavery. And this book was written by actually my advisor, uh, James Brewer Stewart, um, who is, has since retired since I was in college um, from McAllister College. Um, but he is, uh, without question, one of the best uh, historians of the abolitionist movement in America that we have today. And so if I misspeak or uh, uh, inaccurately represent uh, the abolitionist movement, it's not his fault. He actually trained me really, really, really well. Um, so all mistakes and errors would be my fault. But And, and if I do mess up, don't tell him because he'll be very, very upset with me. But I had you guys read um, a selection from Holy Warriors because what um, uh, Professor Stewart or James Stewart does is he really provides us a framework for thinking about the ideological currents, right, that propel the American Revolution. So the ideological currents that propel the American Revolution. And so in his chapter, Abolition in the Age of Revolution, he really focuses on religious uh, ideological currents as well as secular ideological currents. And so the two, um, in those two arenas, he argues, laid the foundations, the intellectual foundations for the American Revolution. And so that's what I want to spend just a few minutes talking about. And so in terms of the religious currents that gave, that created the conditions upon which the American Revolution was, was built, he talks about the Great Awakening. He spends a lot of time talking about the Great Awakening and how it transformed Americans during the 1730s and the 1740s. And so the Great Awakening essentially was a moment in America of deep-seated, uh, excuse me, a deep-seated belief that the moral fiber right, of the country was becoming, coming unraveled, right? And so there needed to be a revival of spiritual piety. There needed to be a recommitment to Christian principles. And so in this religious revival that occurred, not just in the Northeast, not just in the Mid-Atlantic, not just in the South, in this religious revival, in this evangelical revival, many things happened. But one of the things that emerged was the notion of Christian egalitarianism, right? This belief that God created man, despite race, despite gender, despite ethnicity, as equals, right? And for a true Christian would embrace this idea, right? And so this had tremendous ramifications for enslaved people, for slaveholders, and the rest of society, right? So Professor Stewart in Holy Wars tries to help us to understand the religious ideological currents, right, that undergird the American Revolution. And so the reason this matters a lot for slavery is because if you took the Great Awakening to its most radical uh, implications, it suggested that slavery was a moral evil. And in fact, slavery was a sin. And if slavery was a sin, and, and you were a dutiful Christian, you needed to mobilize and in fact organize to bring slavery to an end. Or at the very least, if you were a slaveholder, manumit your slaves. And so this was a very important moment in the history of the abolitionist movement in America, because it gave religious credence to the notion, right, that slavery, while it may have been a, uh, while slavery may have existed in every period in, in, in world history, not just in American history, but in world history, it was a moral evil. It was in fact a sin. And so it provided religious provocation for the abolitionist movement. In addition to, and we could talk more about um, the Great Awakening, we could talk more about Christian egalitarianism, but I just wanted to put that on the table as one of the ideological currents. If we transition to talk about secular uh, ideological currents, 
we would have to talk about the European Enlightenment, right? We would have to talk about philosophers such as um, John Locke. We would have to talk about Isaac Newton or Sir Isaac Newton. We would talk, have to talk about all those individuals and their contributions to the idea that human beings, right, by virtue of being a human being, right, inherently in being a human being, you have natural rights that a king, a state cannot, should not limit, prohibit, try to repress. And so this notion, right, that emerges out of the European Enlightenment and it's transplanted to the United States, this idea that a king, and when, when American colonists talked about the king, they were talking about King George, could, should not and could not be a natural law, repress, prohibit the natural rights that were God given, right? And so in Holy Warriors, um, James Stewart tries to help us to understand that the American Revolution doesn't just occur because colonists are mad about taxation without representation. It doesn't just occur because they feel as if, if, if King George and Parliament is imposing unfair taxes. It occurs because colonists begin to see those, um, those taxes, right? Taxation without representation as infringement upon their natural rights. And so the Great Awakening, as well as the European Enlightenment are the two main ideological currents, right, that give rise to the American Revolution. And so if we can imagine uh, America and the American colonies in the 1760s and the 1770s, if we can imagine in every colony in the United States the presence of enslaved people, and at the very same time that would-be American revolutionaries are proclaiming that the British Crown and Parliament is infringing upon their, national, their natural rights, at the same time they're saying this, there's the enslaved population, persons of African, Africans or persons of African descent are listening. They are listening and they are listening carefully. And so, it's at this moment that you have the conditions upon which Africans, this, and excuse me, persons of African descent begin to appropriate and use this natural rights philosophy as a means to secure their own freedom. And so to say this differently, the ideological currents of the Great Awakening and the European Enlightenment create paths it, it creates paths to freedom for enslaved people. And so there are multiple paths or, or different paths enslaved people could have taken to use these ideological currents to win their freedom. And so what I want to just do for a moment is to talk about those various paths to freedom that these ideological currents created. And so the first is freedom petitions or freedom suits. Actually, in Holy Warriors, Stuart begins his discussion of talking about in, uh, how a group of slaves in Massachusetts, actually in Boston, petitioned the Massachusetts legislature for their freedom in 1773, using the very log excuse me, using the very logic as well as words of American revolutionaries or would be American revolutionaries. And so when we talk about freedom suits or freedom petitions, what we really mean is enslaved people petitioning and or suing, right, the state, whether it was Massachusetts, Rhode Island, or Vermont, suing the state for their freedom or petitioning the state for their freedom based on this natural rights ideology, right, that is being discussed all around them. A second um, path to freedom would be voluntary manumission. Voluntary manumission. And so suddenly, because of the Great Awakening, as well as 
the European Enlightenment, Enlightenment that reinforced many of the precepts of the Great Awakening, suddenly you have slaveholders who feel deeply guilty that they are holding in bondage enslaved Africans, right? And so beginning in the 1760s, definitely by the 1770s, you have a wave of slave owners voluntarily manumitting their slaves, right? In addition to manumission or voluntary manumission, you also had military service, right? We know based on the work of Benjamin Quarles and others that during the American Revolution, enslaved Africans fought on both the British side as well as the American side. And both at, at, at different times, actually, the American military or American government um, offered freedom to enslave people if they would fight on behalf of the American cause. We also know, right, and Dr. Stewart or Professor Stewart mentions in, in Holy Wars Warriors that the British and the British Army, right, offer freedom to enslaved people. And so what that should tell us is enslaved people, at the end of the day, were not loyal really to either the American cause or to the British cause. What they were loyal to is gaining their freedom, right? And if the Americans were offering a better deal, that's what they took. If the British were offering a better deal, that's what they did. And so military service, right, became, again, a path to freedom because of the chaos of war. In addition to military service, um, there was an, yet another path to, to freedom or to emancipation, and that was gradual abolition. You might have a slave master um, who was feeling guilty about holding in bondage enslaved Africans or persons of African descent. But they didn't want to necessarily take the radical step of manumitting them immediately. And so in those cases, slave holders would, um, over a period of years, sometimes even decades, gradual or create a, excuse me, create a plan by which they would emancipate all the slaves in their possession, right? And typically it was on terms that would have been beneficial to that slave master. Um, in many cases, um, slave masters would only um, manumit enslaved people who had become elderly and therefore they were less productive. Um, typically, they did not emancipate enslaved people who were at the peak of their um, working life, right? Um, and so while they weren't willing, but I should say while they weren't willing to take that radical step of immediate abolition, right, because of the deep inroads the Great Awakening made as well as the European Enlightenment made, they were willing to, over time, right, free all their slaves, or at the very least, the bulk of their slaves during their lives. And so, again, gradual abolition becomes a pathway to freedom. In addition to that, um, probably the most potent form of, or the most potent and often used form of gaining freedom during the revolution was simply absconding simply escaping from the plantation in which you were held in bondage. We know that hundreds of thousands of enslaved people voted with their feet and left those the plantations in which they were being held for places in the urban south as well as in the urban north. And so because you had enslaved people, whether they were simply escaping whether they were fighting on behalf of the British or, or American forces, or were they, or whether they were petitioning, right, con not Congress, excuse me, state legislatures for their freedom, right? They were using, right, European, uh, the European Enlightenment ideas as well as the Great Awakening to their advantage. I should pause though 
and say, just so that we're on the same page, that enslaved people did not need um, European philosophers telling them what they already knew, which is they had inherent rights to be free. They did not need the Great Awakening to awaken them morally to the evils of slavery, right? They knew this intrinsically, but those ideological currents provide them a way to use the words of Americanists, American revolutionaries against them, right? For their own interests of securing freedom. And so for the enslaved population, that's why those ideological currents are important. It's not because they came to a realization that they deserve freedom. It's because those ideological currents provided them a way and provided them leverage to, to petition, to sue for their freedom. And so we have to keep that in mind as we are thinking about this. And so what is the result of this revolutionary sentiment that is unleashed by the Declaration of Independence? And actually many years before that, the conflicts between American colonists and the British Parliament, as well as the English monarch. By 1784, 1784, all Northern states, excepting New York and New Jersey, developed either immediate and or gradual abolitionist, or excuse me, abolition plans. Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, which we typically think of as sort of the mid-Atlantic states, eased restrictions on manumission. So before 1784, it had been really difficult for slave holders, even if they had, excuse me, even if they wanted to emancipate their slaves, they, because of the Great Awakening or because of an epiphany they had because of the European Enlightenment, it was very difficult for them to manumit their slaves in those states. But because of the revolutionary fervor that, that took, took hold of America, those states eased restrictions on manumission. So they weren't willing to go the radical step of gradual emancipation plans or even immediate uh, emancipation plans, but they were willing to ease restrictions on manumission. If we go further south, right, if we go to South Carolina or the Carolinas, Georgia, we didn't see immediate or gradual abolition plans being discussed and talked about. We didn't even see necessarily uh, the easing of restrictions on manumission. But what we did see in um, the Lower South is a recognition that slavery and the way in which slavery was being practiced wasn't necessary, right? It wasn't necessary to excessively flog or excessively punish slaves, perhaps for running away or engaging in small acts of sabotage, in part because that only soured enslaved people against the system. And so rather than engage in harsh forms of punishments and penalties for slave misbehavior, even slaves running away, um, and slave excuse me, slave owners in the South came to the, uh, came to the understanding that in order to preserve this system and see this system grow and sustain itself into the, into the foreseeable future, reforms needed to be made. In part, those reforms came because even though enslaved or slaveholders did not want to, would not, and could not in many cases, emancipate their slaves, there was this notion that we can create a slave system that's a bit more benevolent, right? We can create a slave system that's a bit more paternalistic. And if we create a slave system that's a bit more benevolent, but a bit more paternalistic, then we can demonstrate how the Great Awakening, but as, as well as um, the Enlightenment has had an impact on the institution of slavery. And so it didn't lead to radical, um, it didn't lead to undermining the slave system in the South, 
but it did soften it for enslaved people who were living under the yoke uh, of, of the slave system. And so just, to, I wanna give you guys a visual of this because um, I'm talking a lot, um, but I, I wanna sort of give you a visual of how ge by, ge by region, the system of slavery during and after the American Revolution congealed. And so what you see here is a visual of how during the American Revolution and afterwards, various states within the United States began to either gradually emancipate their slaves, immediately in some cases emancipate their slaves, and or soften slavery, particularly in the South, um, during the years of the American Revolution and afterwards. And so if we look at the top, if we look at the northeastern states like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont, those states very shortly after the American Revolution prohibit slavery within their dominions. In the mid-Atlantic states of Pennsylvania, right, Delaware, they don't take those radical steps, right? But they do set about creating gradual emancipation plans. So, more Southern to those states, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, right? They do not, again, engage in or discuss or enact, implement uh, gradual emancipation plans or even immediate. Slavery remains safe in those regions, but they do soften some of the worst aspects of the system. And so what this su suggests to you is that in America, right, excuse me, in America at the time, major changes occurred because of the American Revolution as it relates to slavery. And the reason why Massachusetts, Rhode Island, were willing to take the radical move of prohibiting slavery in their dominions, and Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina were not willing to, is because in the Northeast, these were societies with slaves. In the Lower South, these were societies, or excuse me, these were slave societies. And that's a fundamental difference. What I mean by societies with slaves is this idea that although slavery was a reality, although there were enslaved peoples in, 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 in those states, slavery was not essential or even the backbone of the economy or even we could say the culture. However, the more south you went from the northeast, slavery had a, had a deeper impact on the economy as well as as well as social and cultural relations. And so the further south you went, the more entrenched slavery became. And so because Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and the like were slaves, excuse me, societies with slaves, it allowed them more or less um, to act on their principles, to act on the revelations from the Great Awakening, Quakerism, and the European Enlightenment, because slavery was not essential to the economy or to the cultural social relations of that, year, of that area. And so you could emancipate your enslaved population because at minimum, what we're talking about is a few, or not a few hundred thousand, but we're talking about a small population. However, in the South, emancipation whether it's gradual or immediate, was gonna mean something altogether different. And so what I'm suggesting to you is the reason why Massachusetts, Rhode Island are able to act and act decisively is because their very way of life wasn't dependent on slavery. That was altogether a different prospect for slaveholders in the South, um, in states like South Carolina. And South Carolina is actually a good example because in South Carolina, there are more enslaved people 
there, there, then there are American colonists and eventually American citizens. And so it would be a different prospect altogether for them to engage in immediate and or gradual emancipation plans. And so I said all that to say that this question of abolition, right, during the era of, America, of the American Revolution, um, is a very complicated um, story. And in order to help you maybe understand how complicated it could become, I want to talk about, very briefly talk about uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, so I want to switch from this sort of macro approach to talking about uh, the American Revolution and really get down on the individual level and talk about Thomas Jefferson. Because I think through Thomas Jefferson, we can understand some of the contradictions, we can understand some of the rationale for why slavery persisted despite this revolutionary uphill around natural rights and Christian uh, egalitarianism. And so <clears throat> we all know who Thomas Jefferson is. We all know that he was the co-author of the Declaration of Independence. We know he was the nation's third president. We know that he was one of the, um, he was a student, excuse me, of the European Enlightenment. We also know that he was a slaveholder. Um, we know that he had firm anti-slavery convictions. But we also know that he, over the course of his life, never freed any of his slaves. And so we know that Thomas Jefferson, right, is a very complicated figure. And so what I want us to talk about, though, is the very, the, the, how these tensions, right, help us to think about why someone like Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, as well as individuals connected to Jefferson or connected to the slave economy, found it really difficult, right, even with the revolutionary upheavals, upheavals that are occurring around them to emancipate their slaves. And so just to give you guys a little bit of a better sense of how deeply committed Jefferson was to uh, anti-slaveryism, I want to share with you a passage. Um, this is the Declaration, or a portion of the Declaration of Independence. And typically, when Jefferson or anyone else wanted to point to the, the principles that the Declaration of Independence stood for, this is the brief passage that they would have mentioned. And this passage is known, was known to Americans then, is known to Americans today, right? As sort of the, 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 the unequivocal language about the, the, the natural rights of man. What people typically don't know or not aware of is that in one of the initial drafts of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson being the main author, there were five or so uh, authors of the Declaration, but Jefferson was the main one. And Jefferson included in the Declaration some anti-slave trade language. And I, that's what I want to turn our attention to, to has to demonstrate his deep and genuine anti-slavery convictions. So I'm going to actually walk from behind the lectern and read this or, or talk about specific uh, words in here. And so in this passage, I'm just going to read a portion of it. Um, Jefferson states, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself. And when he's when he says he, he's meaning King George. He says, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of distant people. And here he's talking about enslaved people who've been impressed into this slave trade, who never offended him, capturing and carrying them into slavery, 
in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This practical warfare, the opprobrium, opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king, and by saying Christian, he's trying to indict him, of Great Britain. It even gets better. I'm gonna click her here. Jefferson goes on to say, determined to keep an open market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislature's attempt to prohibit or to restrain the execrable commerce, right? So he's blaming King George from preventing American colonists from prohibiting or restricting the slave trade as well as slavery in the colonies. And that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms amongst us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people upon whom he has also obtruded. Right? And so here, Jefferson is saying, King George has prevented us from acting on our anti-slavery convictions, has perhaps prohibited us from ending the, the evil slave trade, but yet at this moment, He's using those very people who he's deprived of liberty. He's using them, right, to deprive us of our liberty by encouraging them to fight against our efforts. And so he ends by saying, thus paying off the former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with the crimes which he urges them to commit against lives of another. And so in this passage, Jefferson is arguing that in America, it's King George that's to blame for the growth of the slave trade as well as the growth of slavery in America. He and others, right, firmly believe that without King George, slavery perhaps, if not on its way to, uh, on its deathbed, would have been in a much weaker position, right? And so you can imagine, you can imagine how slaveholders who didn't necessarily share Jefferson's anti-slavery, and particularly from, from this passage, anti-slave trade sentiment were going to respond to this, right? For them, this was dangerous language. And so those Southern slaveholders, right, who made up not the majority of, but a significant contingent, of the signers of the Declaration of Independence blocked and actually forced Jefferson to redact this passage from the Declaration of Independence. Because if this was allowed to, to, to remain, it would give even more precedent, even more credence to those freedom suits and freedom petitions, right, that enslaved people were beginning to excuse me, that were beginning to make their way through many legislatures, particularly in the North, uh, during the revolution. And so this was dangerous language. And so Jefferson, um, so excuse me, so Jefferson, um, the point here is that Jefferson has really deep anti-slavery convictions, but he doesn't act on them. And he doesn't act on them because in part, I'll show you, he doesn't act on them because his very preservation, right, his very way of life, his sense of self even, his standing in the world depends on enslaved people. Jefferson, despite his anti-slavery convictions, does not want to commit economic suicide. He does not want to commit even identity suicide. And so he feels as if he has these convictions, right? But because of self-preservation, because of his economic, um, because his economic, um, his, his economic standing dependent upon slavery, he could not act on them. And so to give you guys a sense, 
of the tensions this created in Jefferson's mind, I want to share with you just a brief quote. Actually, it's a letter written by Jefferson to one of his colleagues and actually comrades during the Missouri crisis of 1820. And so what I'm suggesting here is that this problem, right, this contradiction wasn't something that was exposed with the American Revolution and Jefferson forgot about. This is something that haunted him over the course of his life after the revolution. And so if we take a brief look here, Jefferson, in a letter to John Holmes about the Missouri controversy, or what became known as the Missouri Compromise in April 1820, and I'm not going to read the, the totality of this, I'm just going to actually go down to the end. Uh, he's confiding in John Holmes the great difficulty um, of emancipation, right, and why it's so difficult for him, as well as American citizens, to take that radical step. And so toward the end here, and I'll just start with the place where he says, um, I would say four lines from the end, in that way, a general emancipation, an expatriation could be effected, and gradually and with due sacrifices, I think it might be. But as it is, we have the wolf, and he's meaning slavery and enslaved, pe and enslaved people, by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice in one scale and self-preservation in the other. And so Jefferson is keenly aware, right, in his own mind of the contradictions of holding slaves in a republic that's supposed to be dedicated right, or predicated on universal freedom, universal liberty, the natural rights of man. But because his economic well-being, his, even his sense of self, is so intimately connected with holding Africans and their descendants in bondage, he nor can other Americans who hold slaves bring themselves to the radical, um, the radical action that would be necessary, which would be to emancipate those slaves. And so what I'm suggesting, or what I'm trying to get at, and I'm going to return now to the provocation that I began with, which is Edmund Morgan's assertion or actually argument that this period is a period in which the central paradox of American history emerged. What I want to try to do just in a, in a, just in a few minutes, because I don't want to go over the 50 minute um, time frame, is to suggest how perhaps it wasn't in fact an American paradox. If we understand the context in which Jefferson is operating. And I, I'm trying, I, or I tried to sum this up in about four points, in about four points. And so, the first thing that we have to consider when we talk about this American paradox, right, this seeming contradiction between espousing liberty as, and, uh, as well as holding people in bondage, is that white American colonists, and particularly revolutionary leaders, whether it's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, right, who are both slaveholders, these same individuals who become patriots, who become um, leaders of the American Revolution, have a fundamental belief in the inferiority of African peoples, right? And so when they espouse these ideas of universal freedom, natural rights of men, they never intend though, that, that language to apply to those populations. Never, ever. Despite their misgivings about slavery, they did not believe, fundamentally believe, that those individuals were deserving of the same rights that they so desperately wanted, that they were so desperately fighting for from the British crown. And so that's point number one, 
Point number two is that, and Jefferson is a good example of this, his way of life, his sense of self, was premised on enslaving, in his case, hundreds of Africans and their descendants. And so rather than it be a contradiction, right, in many ways, and historians, uh, particularly after Edmund Morgan has argued, is that universal freedom for white males in, 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 in post-revolutionary America was best served if you had a population in which, excuse me, in a black population that was unfree. Because that would create a sense that the rights and privileges of whites, right, were greater than, if not superseded those of enslaved people. And so there was a way in which slavery guaranteed, right, the universal liberty of white in a way that it may not in, in a society in which slavery didn't exist. In addition to this, when we talk about, and I showed you the graphic of in the Northeast, right, many mission occurred frequently in the thoroughgoing, but the more south we went, particularly in the lower south, uh, emancipation made a very small, if any, indent on slavery. And so what that means is that, again, in the south, because slavery was concentrated there, as well as the economic backbone of that region, it was not in those slaveholders' self-interest. Right? It was not in their self-interest to emancipate their slaves. And in fact, those same slaveholders never really considered right, ridding themselves of slavery because the one thing they feared right, more than emancipation was a slave revolt. Or once slaves were emancipated, right, that they would take revenge on their masters who had treated them cruelly. And so because, in particular in places like South Carolina, enslaved people um, are more numerous right, than the white inhabitants, right, there was, this was never a consideration, right? And then finally, finally, in addition to sort of, in particularly in the South, abolishing slavery, or emancipating slavery, not being in slaveholders' self-interest, or even members of that society, beyond that, in the, in, in the South, as well as in the North, there was this, this idea that even if you emancipated enslaved people, that those individuals very shortly thereafter, right, would begin to, that, that, that population would begin to decline because, right, they were inferior and in, in unprepared for citizenship or for freedom. And so in all these ways, this logic militated against universal emancipation during the era of the American Revolution. And so, when you understand the context of the American Revolution, you understand that those words of natural rights, those words of universal freedom, were never meant to apply to the enslaved population. And in fact, the slaveholders believed that acting on those principles, acting on those enlightened principles, would not be in their self-interest. And so because of those things, it's not tr a true paradox, right? It's not a true paradox. It makes sense, right? To some sense, economic or otherwise, why slaveholders held enslaved people in bondage. And actually, slavery grows afterwards, after the revolution, because of that self interest, right? And so I would argue, I would submit to you that Morgan's paradox isn't truly a paradox at all. Um, I'll pause here, because um, I can say more about this, but I think I've actually probably been a little bit over time. But I'll pause here, and if there take questions at this point um, about anything that I've said and or just the period um, in general.